So, um, holy shit, man. 2017 was a really good year for movies. Like, surprisingly good. Um, in fact, when I was going to make my list for my top 10 movies of this year, I was sitting there going through a list of all the movies that came out in 2017, and I'm like, okay. And, like, you know, every time I saw one, I'm like, that's a top 10 contender. I, like, wrote it down. And, you know, like I would normally do. And I was like, I'll, I'll write down all the ones out there are contenders. And then, I'll, and then I'll, like, you know, narrow it down to, uh, like, the top 10. When I narrowed it, when I put down all the contenders, I ended up with a list of 20 fucking movies. I had double the amount of movies where I'm like, yeah, this is like a top 10 contender. I'm like, Jesus Christ, that's a lot of fucking movies. Like, most years... Okay, not most years. Like, some years, I can't even, like, get ten movies that I think are, like... Yeah, these are, like, my favorite movies of this year. Um, this year, like I said, like, fucking uh, 20. So what I did was... Uh, you know, I, I wrote two lists. Uh, one is, like, a list of the actual top ten. And then, a and then the other list is... Um, the 10 Honorable Mentions. So, uh, the 10 Honorable Mentions, I'm just going to go in the order that they were released in. And talk about all of them. You know, just, just a little bit, you know. Like I said, like, like any of these movies, like any, any other year that wasn't so densely packed with movies that I ended up loving, these, any of these could have been, like, like, uh, in my top 10. And... You know, like, I don't think, like, a lot of these would have been, like, you know, like, oh, this this could have been, like, my favorite movie of the year. But I'm like, yeah, like, some of these definitely could have easily been, like, in my top five. But, yeah, so. So, yeah, starting off, um, first really awesome movie that came out this year, Lego Batman. Uh, I love the Lego movie. Uh, it was one of my favorite movies that came out that year that it was released. And, uh. Like the Lego, like, you know, Lego Batman, uh, about the same quality of uh, filmmaking, really, really liked it. Uh, I like the fact that it was both a, like, a, a send-up to Batman and also kind of a critical deconstruction of Batman at the same time, while also being a fun kids movie. You know, it poked fun at the character, but it also did what it did so in a satirical way that made commentary on him. Great movie. Great, great, great movie. Uh, John Wick 2, like, I only just saw John Wick earlier this year, like, before I went to see John Wick 2, I was just like, I really need to see John Wick, I saw John Wick, blew my fucking balls off, I'm like, oh my god, this fucking movie's awesome, like, how did I not see this the year it came out, uh, well, I mean, it, it looked like a generic action flick, and I was just like, oh, whatever, uh, but, saw John Wick, it was fucking fantastic, saw John Wick 2, um, like, it, John Wick 2 did exactly what I wanted it to do, which was take this world that I thought was really interesting from the first movie, because, like, there's little hints of a really interesting world in John Wick 1. And I'm like, I wanted to see that expanded. I want to see, like, the, like the scope that the, of the world that John Wick exists in. And you really get a much larger scope in this film. And uh, that was great. The action is still great. I don't think the action set pieces are quite as good as the action set pieces in the first one. Um, but beyond that, uh, yeah, no, it's fantastic. And still, like, the action sequences are some of the best fucking things I've seen in movies ever. So, even though John Wick 2 does not hit the high bar that John Wick did, that John Wick 1 did, uh, in its movie, like, you know, it still had some of the best action I've ever seen. Uh, number three is a really weird one. Uh, The Cure for Wellness. Saw trailers for that, I'm like... I am totally into weird, trippy fucking movies. So I saw the trailer for uh, A Cure for Wellness. Really wanted to see it. Uh, went with my friend who I usually go to see weird, trippy fucking movies with. And I enjoyed this movie, but it's... Oh my god, that movie's too fucking long. Um, like, like someone find me like the 90-minute cut of this movie. Like, like I need like a 90-minute fan edit of this movie uh, that just cuts a lot of the bullshit out. Because, like, like me and me and both me and my friend were just like, that movie was really cool and interesting. 
it, it overstays its welcome so much. Like out of all like the twenty movies that I wrote on this uh, that I wrote down, this is one of the few that I don't think actually would have made it into a proper top ten. Like I wrote it down as an honorable mention, and that's because. Like, you know, I, I didn't think it was actually going to make it. I just didn't know I was going to end up with ten fucking honorable mentions. But, you know, like, Cure for Wellness, like, really fucking out there, ballsy fucking movie. And some shit, and really unsettling at times. And I really wish it were more unsettling more often, and that it were shorter. Um, you know, like, because it felt like a really kind of boundary-pushing film. And it's usually my kind of jam, and I just kind of wish it was just a little bit more of my jam. Uh, speaking of things that are also my jam, the Belco experiment. Uh, I am a fucking whore for uh, exploitation films, like just super violent schlock. And this film really was just like my bread and butter. Here, once again, the Belco experiment. Any fucking year, that totally would have been on my fucking top list of favorite movies. Like, like this is fucking nuts that like like this movie didn't end up on there uh, at all. But that's just how it goes, you know, like, Belko Experiment, if you like grindhousey, schlocky, violent, ridiculous, over-the-top movies, check out the Belko Experiment. Fucking, fucking ruled. If you're into that kind of thing. Uh, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, I probably should have mentioned this with Batman, but, like, this was a great fucking year for comic book movies. Like, every comic book movie I have seen this year was great. Uh, and I am saying that, uh, with the caveat that I did not see Justice League. Not because I didn't want to see Justice League, but because Agro went and saw Justice League without me, and I am not going to try and convince any other human being to go see that. Like, Agro's a human garbage disposal when it comes to entertainment. I'll just pour whatever fucking shit down his throat that I can. Like, you know, and he, he, he'll be fine. You know, because he consumes enough garbage as is, a little extra isn't going to kill him. Uh, I will not do that to I will not do that to most human beings and be like, come on, let's go see this garbage thing. Yeah, no. Uh, so yeah, uh, outside of you know, like not seeing Justice League though, because of that, every fucking superhero movie I saw this year I loved, and Spider Man Homecoming was no different. Uh, I really really liked this movie. Uh, I loved the portrayal of Peter Parker. Uh, I loved. Um, Oh my god, Michael Keaton as the Vulture. He was great. Uh, all like the side characters are great. Giving Peter like a best friend who knows his secret. Brilliant. Uh, it's really nice to see him have someone to open up with. Um, I like the fact that Aunt May finds out his identity. Find out, oh, by the way, I guess spoilers. For that. I mean, it's not a big plot point at all. Um, it's just a thing that happens. Um, so sorry if you haven't seen that. Um, my bad. Uh, I can't edit that out, unfortunately, until, like, you know, still no computer. Uh, but, yeah, uh, fucking Spider-Man Homecoming, though. I fucking dug the shit out of this. I love the twist with the vulture in the third act. Uh, that was, like, the thing that movie was missing. Because, like, I'm hitting the third act, the beginning of the third act, and I'm like, okay, this movie's starting to run out of, this movie's kind of run out of steam. I'm kind of not feeling it anymore. And then the third act twist hits, and I'm like, oh, there it is. That is the hook that this movie needed to, like, propel it up at the end on an upswing for the finale great fucking movie uh my second favorite spider-man movie right after spider-man 2 like it's really really good uh atomic blonde um uh, really good you know fucking action flick starring charlie Theron. um it was a movie that caught my attention when it was originally uh being advertised and i was not expecting this movie to be such a espionage spy flick thing. Like I was not like like I was expecting kind of a very different movie from Atomic Blonde. Like a, like a bit more like John Wickish kind of like you know like more stripped down. Like not um you know not as intricate of a story uh, that that I got in this film. So yeah, Atomic Blonde ended up being really goddamn good. Um, like. Like I said, it was the same level of good I expected it to be. It was just a very different movie. Because like, like I said, I wasn't expecting this whole spy espionage angle to the film. And for that to be such a big part of the storytelling. But yeah, Atomic Blonde was good. Um, the lesbian like, romance subplot thing was a little weird. Not because it's a lesbian, just because like 
like the like the, the romantic subplot in general kind of felt just kind of shoved in there. But then again, it's a spy movie, so I guess maybe that's why they kind of felt the need to do that. It's like, oh, well, it's, like, she's like a chick James Bond, but without the gadget. So, like, yeah, she needs to, like, fuck a hot chick. And then, all right, I mean, I'm not going to complain, but it just kind of felt unnecessary. Um, but then again, I guess, you know, like the romantic uh, shoehorn sub, uh, romance subplots are always kind of unnecessary in spy movies, so there's that. Uh, it... The remake of It. Holy shit. Uh, Agro and I did a video on this. Um, we already talked about it at great length there. I'll just go ahead and say, like, yeah, no, this movie fucking shocked the shit out of me. I did not expect it to be as good as it was. Holy fucking shit, man. It was a good fucking movie. <laughs> I was not prepared for that. And Pennywise, uh, that guy's performance in it was fucking good. Uh, Blade Runner 2049. I didn't want a fucking Blade Runner sequel at all. I think Blade Runner is a perfect fucking standalone movie. Why are you going to make another fucking Blade Runner? Why are you going to fuck up Blade Runner? And it came out and I liked it. Uh, obviously, because it's on my honorable mentions. Uh, I feel some of the elements don't coalesce properly. I don't want to spoil anything uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. But there's some plot points I don't really feel coalesce really well at the end. Uh, there's kind of like, you know... Like, you know, the, the, like the weird kind of cult thing that gets introduced in the third act. It's like, oh, yeah, like, like you know, we're part of this thing, blah, blah, blah. And that, that doesn't really pay off in any kind of meaningful way. Like, it felt more like a sequel bait thing. Uh, you know, the thing with the uh, replicants? Yeah, replicants. I almost said reploids. Replicants. Uh, but, yeah, uh, it's, you know, like, like th there are some things. Also, I don't like what it retroactively does to Deckard and uh, Rachel from the first movie. Uh, it took these two characters who are very normal and plain in their own movie and kind of, like, makes them these big, really important figureheads uh, in this movie. Like, now they're really important characters in this universe retroactively, and I don't really like that. Uh, that's something I was worried this movie was going to do. So it has its issues that really kind of pull it down. Like, this movie really came close to being, like, in my top ten. Like if this movie didn't have a lot of like the third act issues that it does. I would have liked it uh, probably a lot more than I did. Or than I ended up liking it. Like I said it probably it easily would have been in my top ten. But it had some things in the third act that really kind of dragged the whole thing down. Fucking fantastic hard sci-fi movie. Like it's good to just see a good hard sci-fi movie again. But like I said uh, for just what it does to Blade Runner uh, original retroactively. As well as just some of like the subplot stuff that doesn't really pay off. Yeah, it's it's a little lower. It's my honorable mentions. Uh, the Babysitter. The Babysitter is a Netflix original film, which I almost forgot to put this on here. But I forgot it existed. But it's a uh, another kind of '80s throwback exploitationy uh, horror comedy thing. Um, it's great. <laughs> it's genuinely funny. Um, I love the cast of characters, um, it's ridiculously stupid violent, and it's good satirical stuff, stuff, uh, really ridiculously well directed, I was shocked at how well it was directed, um, just, you know, everything has, like, a build-up and a payoff in it, and, yeah, it's, it's one of those movies where, like, every scene in, like, the first half of that movie, uh, is in service to the rest of the movie, it's either setting up a plot point or a character motivation or like a MacGuffin or not a MacGuffin, but like a Chekhov's gun or, you know, it's, it's always doing something like, like every, every scene, scene g gives you some piece of information that's going to come back later in the film. And I always really appreciate good tight narratives that do that. So yeah, like the babysitter, fucking funny, ridiculously well made. I was... Like, that was, like, a surprise movie that just came out of nowhere. I'm like, oh, that looks like an interesting movie for Netflix. Whoa. Also, great fucking 80 score, too. Because I remember, if I remember correctly, that one had a really bitchin' synth 80 score. And while I'm on topic of 80s, the last movie on my, um, uh, in my shit, honorable mentions, is Thor Ragnarok. Holy shit, we made a good Thor movie. Uh, Agro and I already talked about uh, Thor Ragnarok at great extent. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much back into it, but just man, that movie was a fucking roller coaster and a blast. Just, just how fucking 
80s that movie was. I love it. It was just, it was a fun fucking time. Um... Once again, like I said, like like any of these movies could have easily been like, like like this feels like a top ten in its own regard. Like looking at this, I'm like, yeah, this could easily could have been like its own top ten list, but it wasn't. Like you know, the the these are what's left over after I pared down the actual top ten for me of this year. Uh, before I jump into my favorite movies this year, I did want to talk about some of the bad movies I saw this year. Uh, I made it a point to not really see. Like, you know, bad movies. But there was three in particular that I had to give the time of day to. Uh, one was Power Rangers. I'm a huge fucking fan of Power Rangers. Uh, I already did a video talking about Power Rangers. And my feelings on that movie. Um, pretty much the, the, the feelings I thought I was going to have uh, before I had seen it. Were pretty much spot on. What I thought the movie was going to be. How it was going to be uh, executed. All that stuff. Uh, pretty much was spot on. I hate the costumes. I hate the queer baiting with Trini. Like, fucking make her gay or don't. Or make her bi or don't. But don't, don't do this kind of side eye. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't bullshit. You know, fucking do it or don't. You know, I'm not gonna fucking... I don't care what the hell I say in interviews. Oh, oh, Trini's are the first lesbian superhero. No, fuck off with that nonsense, you know. Um, I... I feel like it was an adaptation that really missed the point of Power Rangers. Like, you know, make Power Rangers fun and adventurous and kind of silly. Don't try to take the Power Rangers and ground them in reality. It doesn't fucking work. Um, you know, like, like, like you need some of those funner, more lighthearted elements. Like, like Thor Ragnarok should have been the tone they were aiming for with Power Rangers. Not fucking the OC with some superhero suits. And uh, a giant robot. Which a giant robot looked like fucking dog shit. Goldar was fucking horrible. Bad fucking Power Ranger movie. Uh, Alien Covenant. Also did a video about this. F fuck man. I just only recently watched. I think I watched. Started watching the Alien movies this year. Or maybe I started watching them last year. At the end of last year. I don't remember when I started watching them. I have videos about the Alien films. I recently went through and watched all the Alien films for the very first time. Thought they were fantastic. Went and saw Alien Covenant. Didn't like Prometheus. Fucking thought Covenant was worse, I think. Yeah, no. Covenant was worse. Yeah, definitely. Um, like, I think some people may like it more because, like, it has more Alien-type stuff. But that's the thing, though. It's like Alien Light. You know, it's just like, oh, here's a couple of things that kind of reminiscent of, of an Alien movie shoved in the middle of this shitty Prometheus sequel. <sighs> movie was fucking garbage. Uh, then Ghost in the Shell, which really isn't a terrible movie. It is a perfectly competent movie um, that took fantastic source material um, and adapted it into a shallow bland, forgettable movie. And I feel like that's almost worse. But you take, like, like... Ghost in the Shell is my favorite anime film. And this is one of my favorite movies in general. So to see a live-action adaptation of it, and it's shot in this very kind of generic, superhero-y, or sci-fi action-y way, like the slick, modern Hollywood style of filmmaking. And it just feels really homogenous, real, just lacks any of the flair character and personality that, that any iteration of Ghost in the Shell has ever had. Because, um, yeah, it's just the most sterile and uninteresting version of Ghost in the Shell. And they basically completely stripped out all the meaning of Ghost in the Shell and did RoboCop is what they did. They did a less version. And like, I love RoboCop too, and they did a shittier version of RoboCop on top of it. So, yeah... Um, like Ghost in the Shell, not a god awful movie. Like, I mean, you know, if you got nothing better to watch on a weekend, you can, I guess, if I had to recommend any of these, I would say that one. But, you know, like, honestly, like, I think the Death Note movie, because, like, the Death Note movie, I actually, like, got on my soapbox and defended with uh, Agro. And, you know, because there was directorial style there, there was a vision there. I understood the filmmaker and what he was trying to do. He didn't really do it all that well, but I at least appreciated the effort. Like, like, like I saw a vision in the Death Note movie. 
Like, you know, I felt like there was artistic merit in the Death Note movie. Uh, Ghost in the Shell was just... You know, they got they went and got like a Mick director, you know, just like some random fucking director, you know, that just, you know, to to, to produce them like like an assembly line, a movie that they can market off of this fucking license that they bought. And yeah, it was just not good. Uh, actually, shit. Uh if you want to know want me to go way more in depth on that and the other uh Ghost in the Shell movies, the animated ones, uh me, Dan and Bob from Gigaboots did uh, a, a Weaboots podcast about it. So, there, like, I, there's a big-ass fucking video of us just talking about it on this channel. And you can go ahead and check it out there. If you want, like, a more in-depth uh, why I didn't like that movie. So, now we get to my top ten. <laughs> the, 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 thing, the thing that this video was really about... Uh, I don't even know how long I've been fucking recording. This is probably at least 15 minutes of this fucking video, if not longer. So it's probably 20 minutes by now. Uh, number 10, Logan. Like I said, this was a good fucking year for comic book movies. And Logan was... That was like, like some genre-elevating shit right there. And I, I love what Fox has been doing with the X-Men brand lately. Um... They've been way more ambitious from, like, like Days of Future Past, having the balls to just do a full comic book style reboot movie on your own universe, your own cinematic universe. That's fucking wild. Like, no fucking uh, movie has done that. Like, the only movie I can think of that was just, like, to do something that wild and uh, crazy would be uh like the like the third planet of the apes where like the whole fucking timeline like loops back in on itself uh but yeah uh, it's like like Lo logan though um logan just shows like you know fox is willing to take risks that i'm really worried aren't going to be made after this like at, now that fox is part of disney and, you know, they're going to try to integrate the X-Men back into the MCU. And I'm not fucking happy about that. Because I really want to see Fox continue to do more creative and interesting things with the X-Men brand. I think that think what they're doing now is some really good stuff. Uh, I'm really excited to see the new mutants. I'm, like, I loved Logan. I want to see their Dark Phoenix movie. I want to see where they're going to go with this new timeline that they've created. But as for Logan itself, though, fuck, man. Like, just... What a send-off for Hugh Jackman. And just the emotional gut punch that that movie is. It is grim and just... It's an unhappy movie to sit through. But it's one that I would easily recommend to people. Because, like, yeah, it, it's it's not like, like yeah, the fun Aven uh, like Avenger-style movie where... Yeah, I'm gonna go watch that again next week. No, like... Like, Logan is something you sit down, like, maybe once a year, and you, you put yourself through that, and just, whew, man, that was, you know, it's it's emotional, it's hard-hitting, it's bleak, it's somber, and it doesn't feel try-hard. It really feels like it earns uh, everything that it does. So, yeah, Logan, great fucking movie, and a great goddamn send-off for Hugh Jackman. Uh... Number nine, Mother. Uh, man, I never thought I'd see a movie this trippy and weird on this high of a budget with these kind of actors in a theater for a mainstream release. What the fuck? Like, you get goddamn uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Lawrence, you know, starring in this movie. Uh, the first movie I've really seen her get that act in because I've only ever seen her as Mystique and I think she's pretty terrible as Mystique. And, you know, getting to see her act in this was phenomenal. Uh, fucking just, this movie was weird and interesting. And uh, I, I don't know if knowing the, uh, the, 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 the metaphor of the film makes it better or worse. Because I knew the metaphor, like what the film's metaphor was before going to see it. Uh, because the director had already said, like, this is what the movie's really about. So, it takes out any sense of interpretation. But, because of that, I got to be like, okay, well, this is a parallel for this. This is a parallel for this. This is a parallel for this. And, um, it was, it was really interesting. And, 
like just getting to see like a movie on this kind of scope and scale and just be that balls out fucking weird was just like I said like I like weird fucking movies sometimes and this was like a good kind of weird and it's one that I'm really glad that I saw like like it was like Jennifer Lawrence was fucking fantastic in it uh the other guy from uh was it like No Country for Old Men or whatever I've never actually seen that movie but yeah he was great uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, just everyone in that movie was really, really goddamn good. Uh, and, uh, speaking of great fucking actors, number eight, uh, Split. Uh, this is uh, Shyamalan's kind of, like, Shyamalan seems to be getting back on his, on track. Like, I've never been, like, a Shyamalan fan. Like, I've never, I've still never seen his three good movies. Uh, Unbreakable, uh, Signs, and The Sixth Sense. I have still, to this day, not fucking seen these movies. I fucking watched The Village, thought it was garbage. I fucking watched The Last Airbender, thought it was garbage. Uh, like, I eventually ended up seeing The Visit because it looked interesting and I heard good things. And The Visit ended up being really good. Um, and here, Split, even fucking better. Like, this man, like, it, it has, like, a lot of the weird kind of Shyamalan things that I know about him as a filmmaker. Um, like, 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 the way he stages scenes, the way he kind of has characters interact, the kind of awkward dialogue that transpires between characters. But, with a character like, um, uh, James McAvoy's character in this movie, it totally fucking works. And just everyone being creeped out and unsettled by him works. Like, like, you feel the discomfort of this guy. And McAvoy's fucking range is so good. Like... Like, I already thought James McAvoy was a pretty good actor to begin with. Um, like, the scope and range that he shows off in this movie is fucking phenomenal. Um, also, he played, like, a very completely different character in Atomic Blonde. So, yeah, man, this man, between that and the uh, his turn as Professor Xavier, James McAvoy is a fucking treasure, man. Like, that guy is a legit fucking actor. And, like, his performance blew me the fuck away here. Um... Like, the ending was really satisfying. I, I had no clue where the fuck this movie was going to go by the end of it. Uh, the way it wraps up everything and ties all of its story uh, elements together and plot beats together was fantastic. Um, Anya Taylor-Joy, uh, fucking, just, she was great. I loved her in The Witch. Uh, I loved her in this. I can't wait to see her in New Mutants as magic. It's going to be, like, yeah. Split was fucking great. Uh, if you didn't see it because you know of Shyamalan's reputation, like, the consensus with this movie seems to be he's back on track. He has gotten back on track as of late, and he is definitely worth checking out these days. Uh, something, and then uh, we got number seven, uh, Baby Driver. Fuck, dude. Fucking Baby Driver was another really goddamn good movie. And, like, what makes it great is just, it's pretty obvious. Because, I mean, like, on the surface, it's kind of just this regular heist movie. But what elevates it is um, all the characters. All the characters are really interesting characters. They're all, like, fully fleshed out. Like, you could tell that um, Edgar Wright, when uh, writing this movie, like, like, he fully thought about who these characters were and the type of people that they were. Like, you know, like, like the, the one really evil motherfucker in it, I think, even has, like, a line about, like, how he has, like, a kid or whatever. You know, so it's like, you know, like, like oh, these are real people with real lives. And uh, another movie where I had no clue how it was going to end, where the story was going to go. Um, like, like that th the entire third act is a fucking thrill ride. And, like, and it was great the second time around, too, because I've seen it twice now. And it was great the first time, and it was great the second time. So yeah, uh, oh, 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 and of course the score. The fucking score is fantastic, and the way it syncs up to the visuals, or how the visuals sync up to the score, is phenomenal. Like, there's a real, just impressive piece of filmmaking in that regard. Like, I haven't seen filmmaking that impressive just on a technical level, like, uh, since Birdman. Because Birdman had, like, the whole transitioning scenes from one scene to the next that gave it the illusion of, a uh, of... Uh, one continuous shot, where with Baby Driver, it's just all the the action beats are completely synced to the music. Like like every bullet fire, every door shut being closed, every like 
pose a character makes or whatever will like you know sync up to the music in some way and just like all the sound effects sync up to the beats of the movie and stuff it's 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 great it's it's like a real technical achievement in that regard fantastic uh, another fucking technical achievement get out number six uh this was a movie that like i actually just realized is this my well i guess okay, i was gonna say i think this is my only horror movie but i guess split also counts as a horror movie yeah, but both of these movies are kind of like horror movies, but they're kind of not. And Get Out was a movie that I'm like, I want to see that. That looks like it'll be interesting. I was worried it was going to be a complete fucking train wreck. Like, you know, it was going to be like kind of uh, awkward and tone deaf. And like it was going to be offensive in one way or, or another. Like it was going to be kind of like, like, you know, fuck the white devil you know, or just, you know, fuck black people. It was going to just be like, it was going to be one or the other, and it was going to come off offensive to somebody. And instead, it rides such a perfect line, and it's just so beautifully fucking executed. And once again, kind of like when I was talking about the babysitter, um, like, like, like everything in that scene ties back into either, um, either it's in favor of the narrative the themes or the characters, and that's something that I really always care about. And like, I think it's what's the director, Jordan Peele. Yeah, he is that motherfucker's a talent. I can't wait to see what he turns out next. Like, I'm going to be paying attention to that man's career without a doubt. Um. Uh. Now we're in the top five, the top five, and uh. This is probably a controversial one, and I was kind of surprised. Like, all right, so Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which apparently a lot of people, like, I've actually had people say, like, oh, you thought Guardians of the Galaxy 2 was good? <sighs> your, your opinion's invalid. And I started seeing, like, a lot of backlash against this movie before I even got a chance to see it. That a lot of people were really iffy on it, and I'm like, really? All right, like, huh, like, I mean, it looked like a good movie, and I go to see it, and like I said, it's in my top five, so obviously I thought it was a good fucking movie, and, like, one of the things that got me was, like, oh, it doesn't have a plot, and I'm like, it, it does, like, like, Ego's story is the plot, and then, like, 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 the, the, the core of the film, I think the problem with people is that Ego's kind of heel turn comes in the last like, like, reveal as the heel, um, comes in the last act of the film, and it, um, you know, like, and, and, like, up until that point, the movie doesn't really have a clear-cut antagonist, but the movie really isn't about its antagonist, I mean, it is, but it's, it's more about the characters and their development and their character arcs, like, everything in this movie, once again, it's about like, it, it's all about the characters, their development, and the themes. Everything is in service to the themes in this movie. And everything is in service to the characters. And, like, this movie, like, makes me goddamn cry. I have seen this movie twice in its entirety. And both times it fucking made me cry like a bitch. Um, that, that, last, that the last few minutes of that movie is just heart-wrenchingly emotional. And just... God damn, for it to be, cause like, like I, I feel like a lot of like the, the MCU films, like a lot of people kind of the criticism, but a lot of MCU films feel very samey. They feel kind of you know really homogenous at this point, and I feel this year kind of broke that 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 feel because you had Spider Man, which is this kind of um, fun, bouncy, low stakes high school movie, you know, like, like low stakes villain surrounded by like a high school movie. So it felt completely different from any of the other uh, Marvel movies before it. And then you had Thor Ragnarok, which was this fun, exciting, space poppy 80s new wave fucking adventure. And you had Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which was just this, this introspective character piece on its characters uh, using the themes of like like you like using the themes of family and um like abuse in a lot of ways and toxic masculinity and and it does all this and explores its characters in ways that the first movie never even 
Like, I never even thought these movies were, would ever touch on these characters. And, and it does it in a way that still keeps the core of the characters. You know, um, especially like characters like Yondu and Rocket Raccoon. Where, like, you know, they're complete shitbag assholes in the first movie. And you don't, like, they don't really have a lot of dimension and depth to them. Then you see this movie, and this movie just completely contextualizes their shittiness. And it makes them confront that they've been shitty people, and that they shouldn't be, and that they need to do better. And Yondu's big fucking sacrifice at the end, oh my god. And just, like, like the, the thing that really break, uh, broke me in that movie was Rocket's last bit of stuff at the end. Like, after he... Because, like, like, Yondu goes, cry, fucking, uh, Peter doing, like, you know, like, like, speaking at his funeral, cry, fucking Rocket, um, talks about, like, you know, I sent a, I sent a signal out to his Ravager buddies and told them what he did, and they show up, and they're firing fireworks in his honor, giving him, you know, that, that, you know, the, the Ravager funeral that he said he'd never have. And cry. Fucking Rocket. Then Rocket at the fucking end comes in like, you know, you know, he was a total asshole to his friends. And, you know, uh, they, they still, you know, they, they, they still stayed by him. They were still there for him. You know, even though he stole batteries that he didn't need. Which obviously, and then Peter looks at him and it's just, oh my god, this cry. Oh my god, this movie, man. Like, the feels in this movie broke me. Like, I... That, that, that movie. Like, like I tried to watch Lindsay Ellis's uh, deconstruction on that movie. And then when she's talking about those scenes. And she's showing the snippets of those scenes. I'm just crying. This movie hits me on such a deep emotional level. And not just, and not just because, like, oh, well, this movie can make me cry. Like, no. Like, this movie gives me characters that I genuinely care about. And explores them and it makes them feel uh, human and real and like like i can personally understand the idea of like you know like you know of uh, of having like like maybe like a really dysfunctional family or being a complete asshole to wall off people so they can't hurt you and things like that like like these elements of this film struck such a personal chord with me that this is Easily my favorite Marvel film. Like this movie just completely elevated. Like I, I, I will still say something like Civil War is a better comic book movie. Guardians of the Galaxy is just the best movie in general that they've made. Like, like, like Civil War feels like a big action, you know, comic book event movie. This feels like a emotional, heart wrenching character piece. And while I'm on the topic of heart of uh, emotional character pieces, uh, number four, Colossal. Um, I am all about like weird kind of once again weird fucking movies. Uh, high concept indie filmmakers doing weird shit. I'm always down for that. And I had heard about this movie originally through Movie Bob, and I'm like, oh right, uh, like that looks. Uh, I've never heard of that. That looks kind of cool. And then I forgot about it. And then on his top list, he had mentioned it again. And his, like, I think it's like his number one, was it his number one film of that year? I don't remember. It was really high up there, though. And uh, I was just like, oh, shit, right, that movie, I need to see that. And it was on Hulu, so I checked it out, and I'm so glad I saw this movie, because holy shit. Um, for those that know, Colossal is about... This alcoholic woman who fucks up her relationship and she moves back to her hometown um, temporarily to try to put her life back together. And then when she's like drunk and like in like this one specific place, uh, it summons uh, a giant kaiju, this big ass fucking lizard monster in Seoul, Korea. And it mimics her movements. So Seoul, Korea is being... Ravaged by this giant monster that is just her walking through like a kid's playground, and um, 
you know, it, it, it has like its little fun shenanigans that it builds off of that. But where the movie goes after that and what it does with this concept is fucking wild. Um, like it doesn't do like it's like anything super high concept. But what I mean is that it it goes into this really deep exploration of both character uh, of like, of the characters and just really gets into like emotional abuse and. Uh, alcohol abuse and dependency and tells a very dark emotional fucking story with this really weird concept in it and and it uses that weird concept to like like throughout the narrative it's not just something like oh here's like this weird thing and then we're gonna do like this really dark storyline on the side like it weaves all those things back in together the other thing i would say is that i kind of wish the movie didn't try to give an explanation to why there's this weird monster that shows up in Seoul, Korea. Because the movie does kind of give... And it's kind of like a dopey, goofy, campy explanation uh, that they show you in a flashback. And that's like the one thing I didn't like. Uh, because cause it is kind of dopey and weird. And like even weird for the rest of the movie. And I feel like I would have been happier just not knowing. Like I didn't really need an explanation uh, for that. Uh, I, I, I could have just suspended my disbelief and been like, yeah, okay, like she does this thing and this thing happens. That is the world I am living in right now. Gotcha. But then they do, you know, the explanation and I'm just like, uh, that's, that's kind of unnecessary. Took me out of the movie for a bit. But yeah, uh, the emotional beats, you know, the, the entire last act of that movie is just a real kind of emotional, uh, I don't want to say roller coaster, but but no, it's it, it, it's it's an emotional ride. It it just it was good, and closes on a really satisfying note. And it was a good movie, and it's one that I feel definitely a lot of people need to go fucking see because Jesus Christ, man, Colossal was a good fucking movie. Uh, number three, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's a really weird one for me on this list because it's my top three now. So that means I put it above Guardians of the Galaxy. But I don't think it's a better movie than Guardians of the Galaxy. In fact, out of all the superhero movies that I've listed so far, I would say Wonder Woman is the worst of these movies um, on a like technical level, on a narrative level. But, you know, I don't need to like the best thing. I don't need... like like The, the best thing does not need to be my favorite thing. And that's something that I make a very clean divide with. Like, I can go... Yeah, no, that was kind of dog shit, but I fucking loved it. Or, yeah, no, that was really good, but I mean, I just, whatever, didn't care for it. And Wonder Woman falls in that category of, it is a really good movie, but its third act completely falls apart. Um, Agro and I have already talked about this at great length, but I think the main thing that really makes it gravitate towards this movie is Wonder Woman is a hero. She feels genuinely heroic. And that is something that I think has been really lacking in a lot of superhero movies. You know, I mean, you get to see, like, like Spider-Man saving, like, helping out the common person. Uh, you get to see, you know, uh, fucking, like, like Captain America, like, catch someone from falling off of uh, Sokovia, like, the, when they elevate up the ground in Age of Ultron, like, and it's trying to, like, pull people back on, like, save them and stuff. Like, like you get to see... You know, stuff like that in movies. But Wonder Woman feels heroic. Like, she feels like someone who is genu genuinely going out of her way to do a greater good. And I fucking just, I loved it. It resonated so hard with me. And it felt triumphant. It felt strong and powerful. And it was great. And it's something that I just feel has really been lacking in superhero movies. That we just don't have that hero moment. Like, Wonder Woman walking across No Man's Land is one of the greatest moments in any superhero movie ever fucking made. Um, the only thing that I'd say comes close to it, that it's in the same ballpark, is in Spider-Man 2, when Spider-Man's holding back the train, and then all the people, like, grab him and, you know, crowd surf him back inside the train. Uh, that's that's like the only scene I could think of that's, that that feels like that level of heroic, where someone is putting their line or their, their life directly on the line 
to save people because that is what they do. Because they are a hero. And they are going to be a hero. And, like I said, great fucking scene. Great fucking emotional payoff. Um, what else? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, just Wonder Woman was just so fucking good. Like, the only thing, the third act, man, like a lot of people, I just, the third act, once fucking Ares shows up and it turns into big CG fucking Dragon Ball Z fight at the end. I don't fucking care for that. It felt totally out of place with the rest of the movie. It felt totally in place with, you know, like, the DC Extended Universe. But in this movie, I really would have appreciated a more psychological battle with Ares. Something more scaled down. Um, not just big, dumb Dragon Ball Z fight. The only thing that's really, like... And, like, like, not even, like, all of that is even bad, though. Because you have the scene with Steve Trevor at the end where... You know, he has that line that I fucking love, which is, you know, uh, you, it's like, you know, I'll save, like, you know, I'll save the day, you go save the world. That's amazing. Because, you know, instead of using the man as like, oh, silly man, you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're nothing compared to this big, strong, you know, independent woman. You know, he isn't used for jokes. I mean, he's used for some jokes, but he's used for jokes in the same way that other characters are. You know, even like, you know, the same way that Diana is. You know, he's, you know, he's still a very proactive character within the plot. And he's still a very useful character within the plot. And, yeah, no, like, it's, it's still a good movie. But that third act, man, it's, it's a bad third act. But it is, the movie was so goddamn good up until that point. That I still, like, it's my third favorite fucking movie of the year. Because... Everything up until that. And like I said, even that, you know, the big dumb Dragon Ball Z fight still has good stuff in it. And it still ends on a really good high note. Honestly, I would say, like, the worst part of the movie is that it's connected to Batman v Superman. Because Bruce Wayne sends her the fucking photo that gives her the whole flashback to the movie. If I didn't have that. Like, don't make me think of Batman v Superman, goddammit. The movie's garbage. Uh, number two. The Shape of Water. <sighs> Wow. Um, this is a movie I almost didn't get to see. Like, it had a really limited release, and I'm, like, looking every fucking week, trying to see when it's going to fucking hit theaters. And then around Christmas, Agro's like, holy shit, Shape of Water is is at our theater. I'm like, oh, thank God. Because last time I looked, it wasn't even, like, within, like, a two-hour, like, a two-hour drive for me. Because, like, like, there's a theater that I go to to see limited release films. And it's, like, a two-hour drive... To get there. And that's how I saw like the Dragon Ball Z movies. That's where I went to go see the MLP movies. That's where I went to go see uh, Shin Godzilla. You know. But not even they were showing The Shape of Water. Guillermo del Toro. The, the, like one of the most fucking respected directors in the goddamn industry. Puts out a movie. And I can't even find it in a theater after it's been released. Like it's been fucking released in all these other countries. Two months before us. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. It's not coming out. I'm still waiting. And it finally fucking comes out two months later. And then I can't even fucking see it. Finally, though, around Christmas, it finally shows up in our local theater. Me and my friends go to see it. And I am so glad that I got to see this movie so I could put it on this list. Because, yeah, this is definitely my number two movie of the year. Give me a moment. <sighs> my throat's drying out. So, Shape of Water. Uh, weird... Fish man movie period piece um sexual sexual exploration film uh it's I really can't even explain or really like talk about like the shape of the shape of water like like why is this movie so good it's just like it's just it, I really should have thought about this before I started recording. Like, like, oh shit, do I even know how to describe how, why The Shape of Water is such a good movie? I guess it's it's good on two re on two on two uh, ends here. One is it is just a really beautifully told romance film, and it's with two characters that cannot speak. One is a mute, and one is the fish man, and you know. And, you know, there are these little emotional beats in the film. Just 
how, you know, like the body language, the facial expressions, like when they, you know, sign language to each other just every so often in the film. Uh, it's, it's great. And like, like I've, I haven't seen too many romance films that are just that good at portraying a genuine heartfelt connection between two, I almost said two human beings. She's not a fucking human being. But, um, yeah, like, like between, like, this monster fish man and, uh, just this human woman. And it was, it was great. Like, all the characters were, were, like, you know, well fleshed out. Uh, Michael Shannon just chews up all the scenery and he's, he's great to have in that movie as the villain. This, it, it was a great movie from beginning to end. Uh... And the other thing that makes it great, you know, because like I said, like, it's twofold. One is just the, the beautifully crafted romance story and, and the characters and the dynamics between the characters. The other thing is the Guillermo del Toro factor, which is just, this man makes beautiful movies. This is just one of the most visually beautiful fucking films I've seen in general. And I will go see any goddamn Guillermo del Toro flick just so I could see a gorgeous ass movie. And it's always worth seeing his movies, even like like Crimson Peak wasn't like an amazing movie, but it was a good movie that was worth seeing, and it was just a visual fucking masterpiece. And I was glad that I saw it. And with The Shape of Water, it was a it was a fantastic film on its own right. But then Guillermo del Toro, his directorial style, his visual flair, his artistic direction just elevates it so much. This movie could have been. A generic, schlocky B film, like B movie, and it wasn't. It was just this really heartfelt, just good goddamn movie. And yeah, like if you haven't seen The Shape of Water, go go see the uh, The Shape of Water. And my number one movie. If you have not guessed it, like narrowed it down by now. Like, I'll give you a second, because you've heard me talk about it in the past, and I've said good things about it, and if I haven't mentioned it yet, it's kind of got to be on this, it's got to kind of be number one, The Last Jedi, which is, man, I really considered not putting this on my list, or well, not on my, not, not removing it from my list entirely, but I tried to not put it as my number one, because I was just like, oh, Shape of Water. But I was like, oh, but I didn't like The Shape of Water as much as I liked The Last Jedi. And I'm like, and I'm trying to think, like, like, the only reason I didn't want to put The Last Jedi as my number one was because, well, it's just, uh, like, it, it's, it's a critical backlash. And if I put it as my number one, it just sounds like I'm being some sort of contrarian, some sort of tryhard. Like, oh, so many people hate this movie, so I put it at the top of my list. And I'm like, you know what, fuck it. Like, I'm not going to be goddamn dishonest about my opinions on this. I love The Last Jedi. I loved how fucking ballsy it was. I love that it completely shook up the status quo. I love... Because, like... like it's really weird, too. Because, like... Like, I've, I've heard so many weird complaints about this movie. I've even had people tell me that, like... Oh, well, you know... Aren't you being, like, hypocritical? Because uh, you've... You know... Like, 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 this seems to be completely contrary to, like, you know... Um, like, about things you've said about other movies. And... And if you've like listened to my criticisms of other movies or other shows or whatever, and you feel like something doesn't align, because I, I get that every so often. Whenever someone like like whenever it's like there's like sort of like critical backlash against something that I genuinely loved, I'll hear people go like, "Well, this is you know this contradicts things that you've said in the past." And it's like, art is not a science. Art has nuance and. Though maybe some of the bigger pitch, like, you know, maybe some structural elements. Like, you know, in this movie I had a problem with this thing. This movie also does this thing. But because of context, because of nuance, because of cinematic language and writing, I thought it was really good in here and bad here. Uh, and I feel like people can't, like, like, oh, well, this thing did this thing and this thing did this thing. So I have to apparently dislike both of them. And when people are really stripping the context out of... Like, Geekdom recently said, like, I'm surprised that you hate Batman v Superman so much 
but loved The Last Jedi, which I'm going to get a hold of his ass for that one. As soon as my fucking computer's fixed, the first thing I'm going to do is call that motherfucker up on, on Discord, uh, hit record, and he and I are going to have a goddamn conversation. And we're going to fucking move that, we're going to have a fucking little video on that one. I guarantee it. But, uh, yeah, uh, and to me, like, just, Batman v Superman does everything wrong. And this movie is a movie that I feel like it does almost everything right. And I I haven't enjoyed, um, like, I, like, this is my favorite Star Wars movie. I really have to sit there and think about it. I've seen it twice now, and I actually enjoyed it more the second time. If you really want me to go more in-depth on, like, the specifics of it, uh, go watch the review that Agro and I did. But, um, after having seen it a second time, like, like, you know, and I, 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 cause the first time I went in, I went in blind. I didn't really know what the hell to expect, except I knew th how divisive it was. Second time I go in and I, I was blown away. I'm like, holy shit. This movie was fucking fantastic. Then I go and I see the second time after I've watched a bunch of people's videos, um, people who were... People who loved it, people who hated it, people who were lukewarm on it, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I went in with that knowledge, watched it a second time, and I liked it even more the second time um, because things that I had, had minor issues with, I'm like, okay, well now I know where the plot of the film is going, I get what it's doing, and a lot of it's theming and uh, like like uh, character arc stuff. Uh, were more apparent, so I'm like, oh, okay, like, this scene is in service to this, and this scene is in service to this, and this is, and, you know, everything felt like it was in service to something else. Like, I really would not have cut a single scene from that movie, uh, which is something, like, the complete opposite, I would say, like, because I just recently rewatched the prequels, and I'm like, God, so much of this fucking shit could just be chopped out, and... I really couldn't see myself chopping out a whole lot from The Last Jedi. Like, Canto Bite, I feel, goes on a little too long. Like, it goes on, like, like just maybe, like, 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 trim, like, three minutes out of Canto Bite. And I feel like you, Canto Bite would be a little bit better. Because I feel like it goes on, so it overstays its welcome to by just a smidge. Um, and, uh... Like, it overstayed his welcome a lot more the first time I watched it. I'm like, why is this here? And then when I went and rewatched it, I was just like... And I knew the themes of the film, and I kind of had a better understanding. I'm like, okay. And it was... It didn't feel anywhere near as long the second time. The second time I watched the movie, the Canto Bite stuff was nowhere near as intrusive feeling. It actually felt like, okay, like, you know, this, this does have a purpose within the narrative. So, yeah. This movie, like, you know, it had... Uh, interesting themes. It had themes. It was a Star Wars movie with themes. Star Wars movies don't have themes. They're stunt fucking uh, sci-fi adventure movies. You're not supposed to think during a Star Wars movie. The Star, the Star Wars movie made me think. You know, it actually explored ideas and had the balls to be different. Um, you know, and... Like, you know, a lot of things I thought, like, well, maybe I just liked it because it was shocking the first time. I go back, I'm like, no, because, like, it, it's still, like, a lot of these shocking, subversive elements still make sense on a narrative, on a narrative level, on a character level. And also, uh, just completely break normal storytelling conventions. It's like, oh, well, this is, this is how you would normally expect a scene to go in a movie, and it goes this way instead. And it goes the, it always takes the, out of like the two routes a scene could go, usually it goes the least predictable route. And it's, it's great. Uh, I loved it. Like it is my favorite movie of the year. It is my favorite fucking Star Wars movie. Um, I look forward to it hitting Blu-ray so I could watch it again. And uh, like I said, at some point Geekdom and I are going to do a video talking about this movie. It's going to happen without a doubt. Um, and, yeah, no, like, I love The Last Jedi. I totally get the people who dislike it. Except for the people who dislike it because, eh, feminism, or, eh, fucking minorities in my Star Wars movie, eh, the SJWs are ruining Star Wars. Fuck all those people. But the people who are like, this isn't my Star Wars, this isn't how Star Wars has been for me, this isn't, 
This isn't what Star Wars has meant to me my entire life. I get those people. And honestly, I wish more uh, things, like more stories, had the, had the audacity to just, you know, shake things up to the extent that they have. Because it's great. I, I loved it. Um, like I said, that, that's all I can really say. I love The Last Jedi. It's my favorite movie of the year. I would be completely fucking dishonest if I said any other movie was my favorite. And yeah, um, if you have a problem with it, suck my dick. Until next time, guys. Zeon out.